with great power comes great responsibility. Who was it said that? Was it um, Abraham Lincoln? No, was it not? Who was it? Who was it? <laughs> it was absolutely, that is the right answer. <laughs> it's actually Uncle Ben from Spider-Man. Um, but the, the sentiment is excellent and, uh, and actually very biblical. With great power comes great responsibility. And um, we live in a culture which tends to view religion with some suspicion and sees it as, I don't know, judgmental and oppressive and moralizing and controlling. And of course, much religion can be exactly like that. But did you hear what it said in our reading? You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. And if you want to emphasize that, have a look at the first verse in the chapter. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Isn't that an amazing statement? God who made us in his image and who has redeemed us in Christ has made us to be free. And early Christianity really embraced that. And in fact, in the ancient world, it was seen as shockingly free. And um, it was a real sort of earthquake in the social order. It overturned old hierarchies. It tended to see everybody as equal. Men and women worshipped together. People prayed wherever they want, whenever they want. There was no sort of priestly hierarchy. Um, they threw out ritual and um, they would say it was really revolutionary. They would say things like there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. It was a real revolution. But of course, as is often the case with revolutions, freedom is a slightly risky business. And um, did you see that verse, what it said, verse 13, it said this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge yourselves or indulge the flesh. And I don't know if you know, but some of the New Testament churches really got out of hand. Like in a shocking sense. If you've ever read the epistle to the first epistle to the Corinthians, my goodness, what was going on in that church? And it's quite different to how we perceive religion to be. They sort of took their freedom to an absolute extreme. Interestingly, what was going on in the Galatian church was sort of the opposite of that and perhaps a reaction. They were heading in the other way, and so they got very strict and started to lay down clear rules, and it was very kind of hierarchical and us and them. Do you see, freedom is a d difficult and risky thing. And in many ways, that is quite a helpful picture of the two equal and opposite errors that we can fall into. As um, Tertullian said, just as Jesus was crucified between two thieves, so there are these two thieves which will rob us of our freedom. Or if you want a slightly more prosaic picture, to be human is to be like a shopping cart with a wonky wheel. You know that experience? You're going in a fine straight line down the aisle and then all of a sudden it veers off in one direction or another. Here are two warnings, two dangers that we fall into. And in many ways, they sort of represent that story of the parable of the prodigal son. Do you remember the two sons? One who took his freedom to one extreme, but the other who got all moralizing and judgmental. So here are the two mistakes which Christians can fall into. The first you might call amoralism. To say that, well, listen, God loves me. It doesn't really matter what I do. That freedom is found in sort of expressing who you are and doing what feels good. And that sort of behavior starts off feeling quite liberating. But very quickly, as I'm sure you would know, will leave us unhappy and often quite 
hurt and bruised by the experience, and ashamed and even addicted. You know, that level of kind of abuse of freedom is a really negative experience. It's a philosophy which marks so much of our society. And far from making us happy and free, it has exactly the opposite effect. So that one perhaps is obvious. The second is moralism. And um, much of what's going on in this epistle to the Galatians is about the danger of what essentially becomes a kind of rule-based religion. It might seem good. It might feel like there's a real strength and integrity, integrity to it. But it very quickly becomes judgmental, cold, holier than thou, thou and bitter. And the irony is, it is no more able to restrain our worst impulses than the other extreme. It leaves us bitter and angry and divided. You know, their church was full of dissensions and factions. Now, you might think, oh, well, that's not my danger. I'm nowhere near that. But I tell you that when we do that thing of beating ourselves up because we made a mistake, of feeling shame because we did something wrong and thinking that God couldn't possibly love us now, we're actually falling into that trap. We're thinking that our you know, relationship with God is based on us being good enough. The two mistakes, one thinking nothing matters, the other thinking that we have to just keep the rules. And these mistakes will rob you of your freedom in Christ. Be wary of them. Just as Christ was crucified between two thieves, there are the two thieves that will rob us of our freedom. And um, in the middle of that passage in verse 19, you had that rather sorry list of the sort of behaviors which blight our lives, our humanity, and our communities. And... um, It was fairly uncomfortable reading, wasn't it? It was the parts of the Bible I might think, well, I don't really want to preach on that one. Um, But I think it's really important that we do recognize that stuff. And one of the things that's very interesting about that list of the kind of the, you know, the acts of the sinful nature is that it's not pointing the finger at one group or the other. You know, we quite like that idea that we say, well, you know, what's wrong with the church is that group of people or that group of people. Whereas that list was, um, uh, it pointed the finger at both. And, you know, at one time it's talking about sexual immorality and debauchery, but then in the next uh, sentence he's talking about the moralists with their discord and anger and factions. Do you see, the problem is this problem of the human heart. And um, neither stricter rules or more throwing off the rules actually makes things better. They are both human responses to the problem. And as Einstein once said, we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking that created them. We need something better, something new. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. And unless we address that, we never see change. So what is the alternative? Well, it was very clear in verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Go to the source of life and liberty. Do you remember... The lovely picture, I've always loved this, in, um, right at the beginning of the Bible in Eden. And uh, God walks with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. And I've always loved that picture. And by the Spirit, we are invited to do the same thing. A little bit like Jesus walking by the side of the lake and saying to his disciples, come and walk with me. Walk in my footsteps. See what I am doing. Follow me and Share my life. The Spirit of God, which God has put into our hearts, invites us to live according to his. And that is the freedom that we need. There's a lovely picture in verse 25, actually, just just after our reading. It said this. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. 
And isn't that quite a nice picture? You see, that's the picture of kind of walking with God. It's not about rules or expressing our freedom in whichever way we want. It's walking with a friend. It's sharing our life with God. And the proof that that works, the proof that that makes a difference is in verse 22. The fruit of that, says the apostle, is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. It is those things which are the evidence of God at work. And it is those simple, everyday virtues which are the most precious thing of all. They are the thing that makes life worth living. When our lives and our communities are marked by those sort of acts of the flesh that Paul talked about and our bitterness and our dissensions and our arguments, life is so painful and so hard. But when life is marked by that, by the fruit of the Spirit, it is worth living and it is full of joy. One interesting observation, you can't make fruit grow. If you've got a fruit tree in your garden, it will do you no good at all to stand there and tell it to grow. It's not how it works, is it? Fruit grows when something is rooted in good earth, when it's free to grow strong and point its leaves to the life-giving sun, and in good time, it will bear fruit. And it is the same for you and me. If we root ourselves in the good earth of God and his word, if we allow ourselves to grow free and strong and raise our eyes to that life-giving sun, we will bear good fruit. The cross of Christ is the place where we are set free, where that old self dies and where the new is born. And if we belong to Christ, by faith we are freed, not to live for ourselves anymore, but to live for God and others. Those relationships are restored. I'm really struck that that relationship with God, which is restored first, allows all of the other relationships to be restored too. Our relationship with ourself changes. Our relationship with other people changes God offers us freedom. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so at the heart of Christianity is this. Christ has set you free, if you will have it. Christ has set you free. And that relationship can and will transform us. What does that look like in practice? Well, I'm not going to say. I'm not going to tell you. Because the danger of me telling you is it sounds like I'm making rules for you. And rules is not the answer. You need to work this out for yourself. That um, you are invited into that amazing relationship with God day by day. And that's for you to do. No two relationships with God are the same. Just as no two relationships between people are the same. So I am absolutely not going to undermine the entire point of the sermon by giving you some rules at this point. However, what I might do is just encourage you in a certain direction with some of the wisdom that the people of God down the ages have found helpful at these times. For a relationship to work, you need to give it time. You need to make uh, it a priority And that was absolutely the case in terms of human relationships, and it is absolutely the case in terms of our relationship with God. If you want that relationship with God to be life-giving and freeing and transformative, you need to give it every time, give it time, and I'd suggest time every day. I'm really conscious of how I start the day, and my tendency is to wake up and then to pick up my phone and look at my work emails, which is a terrible way to start the day, or, I don't know, read the news, which I'm not sure is a great idea either. Why not choose a better thing than that? 
Choose something that points me in the right direction, that reminds me who God is and who I am. At very least, pray the Lord's Prayer to start the day and just sort of set the trajectory right. Set your relationship with God as your first priority. Secondly, I love that idea of keeping in step with the Spirit. And um, I think we need to learn to live and to walk through our days at God's pace. Not at the hyperactive, anxious pace of our world where we're always running on to the next thing, always worrying about the next thing that needs to be done or the next problem that needs to be solved. To trust in our Heavenly Father is to walk at his pace. And it's not a fast pace. Slowing down is a wonderful thing to learn to do. And thirdly, commit to God's people. It is in the context of these relationships that that life-giving fruit is seen, that that stuff that makes life worth living is seen. And your place in this family is, well, this is where you get to love and to be kind and to be patient and to be forbearing. This is where that fruit is seen, that in the wisdom of God, it is communities of faith that exhibit the fruit of the Spirit and um, the freedom of God. So, to be making that each day, great need, great power, and great responsibility. You have responsibility. You have to make the choice about how you live your life and what you do with it. You need to make that choice each day to choose God and others rather than self to choose not what you feel like doing but what you know is the right thing to do and choose the freedom that is found in the presence of God day by day allow that to set you free you my brethren were called to be free but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature rather serve one another in love This new year, I'd love you to take hold of the freedom that is offered to you, to cast off those things that would enslave us once more, and to live in that freedom with joy, day by day. Amen.